It's a panel. We have a panel. Melissa, how are you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. Piers, how are you doing? And it's good to see you. Good to see you. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Switched On, the programme that takes the crucial issues of the day, gives them a long, hard stare, chews them up a little bit and spits them back onto the canvas of the UK news agenda. Some cracking subjects to get our teeth into tonight. On the programme, we'll be talking racism in football. Can it ever be ignored? We'll speak to one man who actually thinks it can. Plus, 18 to 24-year-olds, should they be made to work for their benefits? And that issue of Greece, it's another bailout. Is that super dream of a lovely, harmonised Europe finally stuffed? for good. Now, a programme like this requires an expert set of panellists, the good and the great, the Premier League, if you like, of talkers and thinkers, and even a real-life MP. We welcome, first of all, Melissa Woodside is with us. Melissa, of course, is media uh, broadcaster and legal analyst, headhunter and polemicist Piers Bramhall is with us, and our special guest is the Labour MP for Glasgow Central. He's Anna Sawa. Welcome, sir. Good Thank to you. see My you. Pleasure being here. Who took a massive turn from dentistry to politics. Absolutely. No one likes their dentists and no one likes politicians, <laughs> so I'm a glutton for punishment. Well, you're very welcome. <laughs> Listen, we've got so much to get through. The missing panellist, the one that you can't see here, is actually you at home. Skype, text, email, get onto the website. That's how you get in touch and make your views known on a variety of subjects. Our panellists have selected their specific areas that have interested them this week. And Melissa, I know you've gone for that issue of the welfare bill. I have, yes. I went out and about and I met with some interesting people. And um, quite frankly, it looks like this uh, work experience programme is slave labour. You're going with slave labour. We'll find out more what Melissa has to say on this mm. in a few moments' time. Now, Piers, you're looking at that hot potato that is Europe, particularly what's happening with Greece. Absolutely. Uh, the bailout or uh, default of Greece is obviously something that's going to affect uh, economies uh, globally uh, and obviously a very important topical issue at the moment. Mm. And Anas, I know that we will get into this in more detail a little later. Racism in football, I thought that was a conversation we had 20 years ago and it had gone away. Look, I think there's still challenges, absolutely. I think the, the recent scandals that have taken place have shown there's still challenges. I think we are moving forward across the United Kingdom, but you've got to be aware. Does it seem odd to you that something that we thought had kind of be addressed is now back not just on the I back pages, it, but on the front pages? I think anyone that's campaigned against racism knows it's something that was on the, the downfall, um, but never gone away. Um, it still exists, sadly, inequality and justice still exists right across the United Kingdom. Um, we've got to take it on head on. We'll find out more about that particular issue a little bit later on. Don't forget, Skype, text, email, you know the drill. First, though, we're going to find out about our first subject. Let's see what's been bugging Melissa this week. If you were an unemployed legal graduate, dentist, plumber, or you had no education at all, would you choose between working for free at a company like Tesco's? Or would you try to find your own means of finding self-fulfillment? And why are these the two options anyway? Whatever happened to apprenticeships? Do we live on Mars? I know the economy is very rough at the moment, but we're not exactly talking about paid employment here. I've actually done that once for the job centre. They, put, they employed me in curries as for a trial run for like five weeks. But to be quite honest with you, all them like trial runners, they were just to save money. That's what they do. So they put all these trial runners in there, but majority of them are never going to get employed, by the way. Yeah, so it's a money-making scam. It's not a scheme, it's a scam. Now, depending on, of course, on where you sit politically on this issue, you might have been giving it the thumbs up when you heard Melissa talking, though. You could have been throwing your beer can at the TV screen. I mean, Melissa, you said that you talked of slave labour and corporate greed. Mm. Do you really stand by that? I do. I mean, if you look at countries like Canada or Sweden, where um, the workfare programs are actually um, developed into a far greater degree than they are here, I think, I think that is the truth. A four-week work experience program won't really benefit someone unemployed in the long term. They can put something on their CV, but that's about it. Isn't the difficulty, Anasawa, that the issue of trying to get youth unemployment down is a total headache. It was a headache for your party. It's clearly a headache for the coalition. Whatever they try to do is clearly going to throw up some anomalies that don't work. This is well, youth as good as it's going to be. Well, youth unemployment was falling under the last government, and it was at record high levels across the country. The problem with this scheme is any scheme that actually has a job, which is something that is a job in all but name, is not fair. What you can have is a false economy of creating volunteer places in, for example, supermarket chains or in high um, 
value um, places or workplaces is that instead of a job. But you're still getting paid, you still get your benefits. Yeah, you, you get your yeah, benefits. You're not getting the well, same what I mean rate. Is, take take, take an example of a, a large supermarket. A large supermarket has a scheme with the government that says we'll create tw 20 apprenticeship places, just say, or 12 volunteer places. If those 20 volunteer places are instead of genuine jobs that they would give if it was a normal um, you know, job that was advertised, then that's a, that's a scheme that's unfair, not fair, because you're actually taking away genuine employment from individuals right across the country. Mm -hmm. Dave, Dave, this is on. completely a separate issue. We okay. We're jobs. going back to the problems with this work experience program here. Fine. And it's, 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 I mean, it's pathetic, in all honesty. This is the best they could come up with. But isn't the Why point? are these companies pulling but isn't out? The point? Tesco da David, out. Here, David here says, do you think working for free at Tesco, this is on email, that will look good on my CV? Well, surely any kind of experience, anything that's shown willing would look good on a CV. As Anas was saying, anything, we, we agree with the, I agree with the principle, but the scheme itself is flawed. We need a better system. We need something more well, in depth. I've made two fundamental uh, points we're missing here. Well, one is a voluntary scheme, so you don't have to opt in. If, you, if you've got other, other volunteer programs that you want to be a part of, you can. Uh, secondly, it's only uh, between four, four to six weeks uh, in terms of the course length. Uh, and thirdly, 50% uh, of the people who join these schemes end up in permanent employment afterwards. Uh, I think that's a fantastic but, statistic. But Pierce, if, if we take the example of if you're accepting that there isn't enough jobs in the economy, which there isn't. Any government scheme should be promoting jobs and opportunities, not cutting them down. Let's remember the whole point of this is your comments. You can Skype, you can tweet, you can text, you can email. Details are on the scheme, uh, on the screen. This is Trevor. My, my daughter is 18 years old. Um, she actually wants to work you know, for, for, for a decent wage just before she goes to uni. Um, and to have these schemes coming, I just think it's, it's, it's really quite, quite awful. Have them doing these, these hours for next to nothing, and I think it's so. I, I believe I read the other day that some of the companies that have been getting some sort of money towards helping these, these young people have not actually been putting jobs for them to use. They've been using it for training up addition, um, their, their staff that already work for them. That, that can't be right. Is it not good to get for your daughter to have some in workplace experience? It's only a few right. weeks. A lot of the young people just go to for. They're not expecting a lot of money, but they're expecting a nice decent sum of money just to, to work and to live on. Okay. If, if yeah. For them to do this, these, these four-week courses and just get nothing out of it, I, I think the only people who are going to earn from this are the, are the, are the companies. All right, Trevor. There's th no jobs for them. Okay, thank, point taken. Thank you for that, Alice. You want to come back on yeah, that point? Yeah, because what we're doing is we're confusing three separate issues. There's a separate issue around the economy and how we get ourselves out of the hole we're in. There's a separate issue around creating jobs and there's a separate issue around volunteering and, and genuine work experience to get back into work. Isn't Can the problem, I... Melissa, that if you went out onto the streets of the UK and asked most people, do you think it's reasonable that people who are in the receipt of benefits at some level, be it temporarily or just for a few hours, at some level put some sort of work back in? What, do, do you not think most people would say, yeah, I think that's fair enough? Of course. I mean, like, there's the basic responsibilities that you have as a citizen. You have rights and responsibilities. We are going to take a very brief pause. If you want to get in touch, of course, you know the score. It's very simple. Details are on the screen. You've got Skype, you've got text, you've got email, and, of course, you can get in touch on Twitter as well. All very simple. Plus, two more big debates to get your teeth into as well. Keep it here. We'll be back in a couple of moments right after this break. And welcome back to Switched On, the only debate programme that puts you right at the centre of every issue. It's down to you to get in touch with us. Let's take another issue here. It is that of Europe, specifically Greece, the bailout, how much money is it costing, what is the British taxpayer having to cough up yet again to make sure that this harmonised European super dream can continue? Well, we sent our mate Benazir out onto the streets to find out what people thought, and we'll talk to Piers about his views on that in just a second. But here's what she found out. The Euro's designed to fail, if anybody knows, if you want to investigate that. The whole thing's basically a large Ponzi scheme. So the idea is countries get into more debt, then the IMF gives them more money to get into more debt, and then when they can't pay it back, the banks will own the countries. The rising unemployment in Europe is terrible. Anna Secretary of ours, um, viva la revolution. Um, get rid of all the banks and the banking families that run everything. Um, there needs to be a massive wipe off of debt. It's that simple. Did that bloke say get rid of all the banks? That'd be a step too far. And their families. And their families <laughs> as well. In the ideal world, you perhaps could do that, but I think that in reality, people have mortgages, they have 
um, loans out and that it's not practical to do that. I think the important point to say is what's come out of the, the Greek situation is uh, a recognition of how right we were not to join the Euro and actually how wrong Greece were to join the Euro. Uh, the point here that I know you're making really, Piers, is that we are going to probably have to bail Greece out again. Uh, I think so. I think it's probably uh, uh, pretty inevitable. Uh, I think most uh, bank analysts will, will probably agree with that. Uh, if Greece, Greece defaults and aren't able to pay back the, uh, the money that they owe uh, in terms of the debt, then unfortunately the banks are going to have a, a, a lot of problems. So do you think they're going to default in March then? No, absolutely not now, because we've just given them 130 million, mm. billion. Sorry. All right, let's take a call. This is Barry, who's calling Switched On from London. Hello, Barry. Hi, Ian. Hi. What would you like to say? Do your studio guests think Greece deserved to be where they are now. I mean, did they just make a mistake or uh, did something untoward take place to get them in this situation? Yeah. I mean, where has all this money gone? That, that is the question, isn't it? I mean, it sort of touches what I was talking about. I mean, I what, think how, how did this happen? You have to look at, you know, the EU on a bigger scale. And I'm by no means Eurosceptic. But you, you have to just, you know, notice, make the basic observation that it's the smaller countries that are doing the best right now financially. It's yeah. the Hong Kongs, it's the Monacos, um, you know, it's it's the littler areas that stick together and the people have the biggest say. Sure. And, you know, we might have lost touch with that. So the small countries that. are doing better, you say? Yes. So so Switzerland, you know, Ireland, they're, they're, Greece, by, they're, they're tax big havens. Countries. Sorry? Ireland and Greece obviously very small. No, I'm not going to go country by country, but what I'm saying is we've lost touch with what the basic, you know, uh, the lowest common denominator, what the people want, what the culture is, you know? And I suppose that's one of the problems that, you know, looking on at this whole, again, the way this European system is linked together, it almost appears to have been constructed so that it can never be broken up. I mean, is, is that a good thing? Fundamentally, Greece made the wrong decision in joining the Euro. Um, it wasn't right for that country, just like it wasn't right for the United Kingdom at the time. Um, they're having to live with the consequences of that. And I think it's in Europe's interest, it's in the UK's interest, that they get through that difficult so period. So you think, you the you think it's mainly the rise. Euro that is to blame for all this? The fact I, I think there's, there's, clear, there's clearly a crisis with the Eurozone. So you don't it's an issue primarily for the Eurozone than the ESR. So you don't think that perhaps um, very stringent EU regulations on exports and that kind of thing, like as Ian was mentioning, EU law legislation, it's ridiculously solid. Like it's, it's difficult to understand. It's been drafted ver in very complicated ways. Um, don't you think that that's affected free trade in some way by all these complicated mm -hmm. regulations? Well, but the problem is the UK, for example, its exports to Europe have increased, not decreased. We're so, talking about Greece, so, though. Yeah, Greece. yeah the, point, the important point I'm making, though, is, is that you sometimes hear, for example, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor saying the difficulties we've seen in the last six months in, in the UK is because of what's happened in the Eurozone. Actually, it's not because our export and our business relationship with Europe has actually increased over the last six months, not decreased. So the UK's trade a, comes from Europe. Absolutely. There's a specific problem yeah. with, it, with the way the Eurozone is made up and the way it was regulated, and that's having massive consequences for, for Greece, but also has a knock-on effect. Isn't for the one of, of the Eurozone. problems that British taxpayers find difficult to understand and swallow, that we're not in the Eurozone, we're part of the EU, but we might still be asked to, to bail out Greece despite that. Yeah, and that's why I say yeah. the primary responsibility lies with the Eurozone countries. But we're still, if we're being asked to pay, that can't be but, right. But we've, not been, that be fair, but we've not been asked to pay. The, the money that we've contributed is money that we paid to the I, our IMF fund. So we're not, we've not given and specific bail I, I, I think it's now a case of damage limitation. We are where we are with the Eurozone. Uh, and if the likes of Greece uh, does the vault uh, and the rest of the countries to follow, then, then the UK will be okay. in a severely worse place for it. Uh, we are, of course, open to your suggestions, comments and opinions. That is absolutely crucial to switch on. It's what sets this show completely apart from others. Your ability to take part, get in touch, Skype, Twitter, text, all very simple. Back to our panel in just a second. But first, the issue of racism and football. I don't know about you, but I remember as a kid, things were, were looking a bit rough uh, in that department, but then it got better, kicked racism out of football, and there appeared to be some pretty good progress being made. So much so that I actually thought the subject had pretty much gone away. It had been dealt with. However, in the last few months, we've seen some pretty high profile issues surrounding racism and football, both in the stands, in the boardroom, and of course, on the pitch. What do our panel think about those issues? And what do we do to begin the process of solving issues surrounding racism and football? We went out with our cameras yesterday to Wembley Stadium. It was the Carling Cup final, of course, Liverpool and Cardiff. Sorry, Cardiff. However, some of the fans spoke to us outside the stadium about their views on racism. It needs to be stamped out, you know. Um, 
the UK has a strong sporting base and a number of sports all over. Uh, racism, yeah, I think it is. Uh, honestly, we've seen the years go by. Uh, we used to get it a lot, 70s, early 80s and that. And it, in a fashion, it has carried on, which I think is wrong. The bottom line is when you leave it blurring and ticking over, that makes it worse, and that's what needs to be stamped out. So that goes for any sport, any discipline. If they dawdle over it, it drags it out, making it worse, and that's my belief. OK, we'll come to Piers in just a second. We've got Joe on the line. Hello, Joe. Hello, good evening. Good evening, Joe. Welcome to Switched On. What would you like to say? Uh, now, I'm a, a white British citizen, and I feel that I don't want uh, someone who is openly racist on the pitch in front of millions and millions of people. So I just wanted to get your, your guys... OK, opinion. racism and football. It, some say it's down to individuals. Others, of course, are arguing that, in fact, you need a bigger body to take this whole issue forward. Like, for example, somebody like the FA, peers. Would that be reasonable? The FA, should they be taking charge of this solely, or is it down to club managers? I think it's down to, to all three parties concerned, certainly the individuals, um, also the management, uh, and definitely the FA too. Uh, I think tougher sanctions need to be brought in place to not only punish the individuals, but the clubs as well, which they're associated with. Um, and to a certain extent, it should be down to the manager's discretion as to, to how much they're penalised. But if the management is failing to uh, control their staff, uh, despite all the money uh, and the fact they're on, uh, Television is role model mm. for, 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 for the youth of today. Uh, I certainly think the, FSA, uh, the, sorry, the FA needs to come in and indeed stamp that out. What, what about the issue, though, of friendly banter? Can any racist issue ever be filed under friendly banter? Look, friendly banter is one thing. Discrimination, whether it be about race, religion, sexuality, there's no place for that in any workplace, and that includes football pitches. OK. Pierce is right to say you're innocent until proven guilty. But they are role models for people up and down the country, and that's why they should be here. Right. Right. Let's take. We've got to take a call. Uh, Judan is on the line. Judan, hi. Hi. What would you like to say? We're talking about 20, 25 years ago in in uh, in, in East London. Um, I was a YTS with Arsenal, and um, after not making the grade there, I decided to travel up and down the country and went to about between 40 to 50 uh, professional clubs, changing my name uh, after making applications in writing with my real named Judan Ali, um, never got a reply back, changed the tax, um, made my names up to English uh, anglicised names and got replies. Stay where you are. I'll, let me just put this to our panel. Anna Sauer is the uh, Labour MP for Glasgow Central and your name wouldn't be described as a Western name. Can you believe what he just said? It, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, sadly, discrimination existed 25 years ago, just yeah. like it exists uh, today. I think the situation has improved over the last... 25 years, but it certainly doesn't surprise me. Melissa, you want to come back on this? I have to agree. Um, I mean, th that's the unfortunate reality with yeah. it at the moment. Something needs to be done urgently I'm to change this. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think public opinion uh, is slowly changing. Uh, I think the 21st century is uh, certainly uh, far less racist than it ever has been. Uh, having said that, we've still got a long way to go as a nation. We're a secular society uh, and racism or, or any kind of discrimination has absolutely no place on the sporting field or anywhere else. Well, one of the reasons I think it's got better in the last 25 years is actually more foreign players coming over and playing with different names, different, um, different colours, different backgrounds. I think that's helped in terms of People recognise it's about their ability on their pitch rather than their background. Uh, great discussion and thank you for all your calls, uh, tweets and texts on this uh, amazing response. Just before we finish, there are some stories, of course, that are pretty interesting, but they might not make the big debate segments of the programme. We've picked a couple of them. Piers, do you want to start for us? Yeah, one of the top stories this week is that Chuck Norris uh, is to have a bridge named after him in Slovakia. Is that right? Absolutely. Joining Slovakia to Austria, uh, which is a fantastic achievement. <laughs> Melissa. Uh, the story that stood out to me is a man's crusade to remove dog mess from around his town. Apparently, a former banker is spending £10,000 of his own money to pick up the dog mess in his neighbourhood. A banker with Former a pooper banker. scooper. Yes. <laughs> I don't think that's going to upset tough. too many people. He picked up 500 really. pieces, apparently. I tell you what, one, one, one story that has interested me in the week of the Oscars has been this film, The Artist, and it's won all these gongs, mm. which is extraordinary, and you know, they've, they've done very, very well. Mm. However, the guy that's the central character who won the Best Actor Oscar, apparently in France, all the narratives that surround this guy's work, all the reviews, satirical shows, you name it, pretty much follow this guy around as a bit of a 
well, let's say he's not rated very highly as an actor in France, and yet he's just walked off with a big Oscar. Lucky like guy. Good, good job he didn't have to talk. <laughs> He didn't have to talk. Maybe that's the what interesting thing is he, he said more words in his acceptance speech than he did in the entire film. Yeah, that's he a went good on yeah. and on. Yeah. It, it kind of looks like a Charlie. Still stole the show. Yeah. It sort of looks like a Charlie Chaplin film with a dancing <laughs> dog, really, doesn't it? it? Does. That's sort of all it seems. Uh, that is just about it. We're out of time, but we thank you for all of your calls and responses. It doesn't stop here, of course. You can go to the website and check out more comment that people have left, and we continue those debates over the week and come back to them on a future program. Uh, Anna Sawa, we thank you for coming my in, pleasure. sir, as our special guest. Thank you, my pleasure. Melissa, thank you for thank coming you. in. Good to see thank you again. You. Piers, we'll see you next week. Pleasure. See you then. And from me, Ian Collins, thanks for watching. This has been Switched On. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>